Hey, what's up? Gleb Alexandrov here for CreativeShrimp.com. Welcome to yet another very exciting bonus tutorial from the Hearts of Small and Video course that we have just released and it blew our mind. So for the next 20 minutes we'll be using cycles to render some beauty shots of our robo. But before getting started, let me take a brief moment to tell you how much we love you. You guys just rock. Thank you so much for supporting us. In this tutorial we'll take a look at some neat tips and tricks to get most out of your 3D models. Our perception of form depends on so many things like lighting, camera angle, material, color, even the ambient occlusion and edge detection plays an important role. So for the debug purposes and to get a really nice preview of our robot, I'm gonna render it out in cycles from different camera angles using a physically correct uh, lighting and shading pipeline of cycles and also its unforgiving anti-aliasing algorithms to make the details really pop. The switch to the physically correct render engine really helps to see the geometry errors and to get a clear, fresh view on the model in general. Once you add some directionality to lighting and some glossiness to materials and maybe some edge detection to the shaders, everything starts looking different. It's also cool to approximate the look of the mesh under different conditions to really see how it works in the silhouette mode and so on. Okay, so here we have matcaps and ambient occlusion enabled by default, and these two things alone, especially ambient occlusion, really enhance uh, the perception of depth and the perception of form. Without the self-shadowing that ambient occlusion gives us, it would be just flat. The small crevices, the details, the embedded parts and the interior parts will no longer stand out. So with the ambient occlusion and with the matcap that simulates uh, the light direction as well as uh, the material properties, but let's make sure we, that we have cycles enabled and let's switch over to the rendered viewport mode. Ta-da! So the default environment settings and cycles work uh, just like ambient occlusion, but this is actually a path tracing engine, so it gives us a physically correct ambient occlusion. Notice how the minuscule details just jump at you, straight at you. And if some pieces aren't fit together very tightly, you will notice it immediately. Also, check out these errors. They are pretty much invisible in the standard viewport mode, but in cycles, you see it. One more thing that I want to do is add a ground plane. Shift A, mesh, circle, tab into the edit mode, fill in the face by pressing F, then G and Z to move it down. Throw in some levels of subdivision to smooth out the outline. And just by looking at the cycles real-time preview, I can tell that it really helps to ground the robot. The contact shadows really give it some substance and presence. Depending on the context, it can also be the integral part of the look and feel of the model. For example, if you plan to use this robot in a game engine, chances are that 90% of the time it will stand on the ground. So it's worth testing out. Okay, now I'm gonna add a light source. This will be the area light. I will move it over there. I will increase the size of the light source to make the lighting a little bit softer. To do, to do, something like that looks right to me. The directionality and other qualities of lighting play a super important role in how we perceive form. I can't stress enough how important it is to test your model under different lighting conditions and also I would say with a physically correct lighting setup so we have bounced lighting and uh, contact shadows. Chances are that the future life cycle of this model will include some kind of lighting environment. Imagine that this is again a game asset or a movie asset then it's absolutely crucial to test it under the different lighting conditions to make sure that uh, the profile looks right, the silhouette looks right, the overall look and feel of, of the shape is still alright with you. And I would go as far as telling that uh, not only lighting is important, but also color management. For example, I have the filmic mode turned on, let's switch to the default mode for a moment. And that's pretty abstract and hard to define, but I think that uh, pretty much all future uses of this model will include some kind of filmic color management. If you're gonna export it to Unreal Engine or if you're gonna render it out in Blender itself with using the filmic emulation, then it's better to test it out right now using the filmic emulation. That makes sense to me. Call me crazy, but I think that the color management is relevant for 3D modeling. Alright, and here are the render settings. Bounces are kept at 1. Start resolution set to 512. X and Y tiles at 256, nothing special, just usual render settings to optimize the viewport speed a little bit. Next I will jump into the node editor and start experimenting with various shading techniques to really unpack uh, the properties of our mesh. 
So here we need uh, the geometry node and two RGB nodes. The idea is to use some geometry attribute like surface normal uh, to mix between two colors, for example. The techniques like this are really helpful for unpacking the geometry. So this will be the dark gray, this will be the light gray. Let's plug it in. And then take the normal node and hook it up to the mix factor. Then go shift A, vector, normal, drop it over here. And drag the dot over there. I will hold Control shift and click on the normal node two times to preview just this dot output. Basically this thing allows us to control the surface normal. Um, the direction that the surface is facing. I'm gonna also add the color ramp node to crank up the contrast of this thing a little bit. And why did I add this dot? Let's remove it. Click on the left flag and move it to the right to increase the contrast. Now shift click on the mix node to preview it. We can tweak the color to make it really pop. Yeah, the orange is truly spectacular. So the point of doing all these shenanigans is to unpack the directionality of the robotic surfaces. By mixing uh, various colors using the normal as the mix factor, we are separating the top facing normals, for example, in this case, and the rest of the normals. Alternatively, we can think about it uh, like this. We added the light source and the directionality of the light source contributed to the perception of form. Now we added the directionality to the model itself. In addition to that, imagine texturing this model later on. Many tools use uh, the surface normals as a kind of a guide for texturing. It's always useful to take a sneak peek at how it will look later on. Okay, so I'm selecting these nodes, Shift P to draw a frame around them, and to open the right tool shelf, call it normals. Right, next I will try a little bit different shading technique to highlight the mesh properties. I will start off by copying these nodes, Ctrl C, Ctrl V, throw in the mix RGB node, hook it up like this. But now let's utilize the point in the geometry attribute instead. Like the previous time, shift A, converter, color ramp. Shift click to preview it and crank up the contrast all the way up. This node could be used to sample the curvature of the mesh and separate the convex and concave parts. Visually it works like edge detection plus ambient occlusion depending on how you use it. It works on the polygonal level so it depends on the density of the mesh which is probably not a very good thing, but anyway, it's pretty awesome for the purposes of edge detection. Let's uh, make the second color a lot darker. Yeah, so basically it works as a makeup for the mesh, it helps to emphasize its features, it really brings the third level shapes and the micro details to the foreground. This, plus the information on the overall form and roundness of the model, granted to us by the lighting setup, makes everything much more readable. That's like seeing your creation for the first time. Like, oh, that's how it looks actually. And that looks probably fine if you're lucky. Things like an over-exaggerated edge detection and ambient occlusion really could change the gestalt. The newly created accents could really shift it. And it will still be an organized whole, but organized in a different way. Like the sum of the parts where the parts are organized a little bit differently. Never underestimate the power of edge detection. Alright, while we're on it, I will show you a little bit different technique for previewing the model with the fake ambient occlusion. I copy this bunch of nodes, now I'm gonna add the vector math node and plug the normal into the first vector socket and the true normal into the second vector socket. Set the operation to cross product. Shift click two times on this node to preview the value. We also need the color ramp node to tweak the contrast. Let's drop it over there. This will be a slightly more, I would say, elegant ambient occlusion technique, which doesn't depend on the density of polygons, but on the other hand it works in a kind of a weird way, but for the previewing purposes it's great. A very cool shading life hack. So let's plug it into the mix factor. Shift click on the mix node to preview it. Let's squeeze the range to about there. Look at how precise and how sharp is the ambient occlusion, it almost looks like dirt. And I wonder if you agree with me, but this effects uh, make a whole world of a difference. Without some kind of dirt and edge grimes, some features of the geometry could be barely visible or practically invisible. And all you need is to add the little touches to give it a push over the cliff, and all of a sudden, loads of details appear out of nowhere. I think it's amazing. And it's very important to build this mental map of how the look of the model 
or how the perception of shape and form depends on the shading features like this. Not only on the shading features, but also on lighting, on camera angles, blah blah blah, all that stuff. A bucket of things seemingly unrelated to 3D modeling. Mm -hmm. And the other such thing is the glossiness of the material. Let's take our diffuse shader and mix it with the glossy shader. Now shift A, input, Fresnel. I will use the Fresnel node to mix between these two shaders. To really see the effect, I will crank it up to something like 5 or even 15. Reflections in general or a glossy component of a material really help us to visually evaluate the curvature. How do we understand that a certain surface is, say, curvy? The reflections and the highlights on the surface of the object give us a valuable clue to understanding its curvature. Okay, so I removed all the shaders and let's add the principled BSDF over here. But actually, hold on for a second. Uh, this mode could also be very useful because now we clearly see the silhouette of the robo. So from time to time it's worth checking out the flat representation of the model against the backdrop. This way we don't get distracted by the details and we pay attention only to the primary shape. So deconstruction of the mesh into different components and passes like silhouette is also an integral part of previewing your 3D model, technically speaking. Alright, another cool universal shader that we can use is the principal BSDF. It has everything we need, including specularity and roughness. No need to create extra mixed shaders. The roughness of zero means perfect, undistorted, crisp reflections. But personally, for evaluating the curvature, I like to use the higher values of roughness. Something like 0 0.2, at least. Here we have a clear code setting for some additional glossiness. You can experiment with all these settings, because each one of them slightly changes the look and feel of the surface, obviously. You can go as high as tweaking the subsurface scattering factor, and it will make it look like it's m made of a crab meat. Just look at this, really creeps me out, as if it's made of flesh, literally. I can't stand it. Let's change the color at least. Let's shift it to a more neutral one. Oh, it looks like a ghost. Okay, if you look from a different perspective, uh, the subsurface scattering effect could help to preview the inner structure of the mesh, something along these lines. Alright folks, enough with the shaders, now I want to do something very exciting. I want to create a camera rig, a camera cloud around the mesh to render it out from every possible direction. Well, from every possible direction, that would be impossible, but still. Uh, the cloud of cameras I'm going to create. It goes like this. Shift A, create a camera, control 0 on the numpad to make it an active camera. If the cycle's viewport is a little bit too slow, switch over to the standard viewport. Okay, what's very important besides the angle of the camera is the focal length. You can change it in the camera settings. For example, here I will set it to 50. This roughly, very roughly, corresponds with the human field of view. Of course, it depends on many things, like the display size, for example. Okay, I also duplicated the camera by pressing Shift D. Copy it once again, and this time let's experiment with the wider focal length. Something like uh, 15 millimeters, maybe. Notice a slightly distorted view and uh, the lines of the model converging into a vanishing point very quickly. And this wide-angle view is totally different from this view. And when it comes to evaluating the 3D meshes, this kind of a difference is very informative. It's just a big step towards understanding of your model, and it's good to see it with a fresh pair of eyes, and the focal length give you such an opportunity. Alright, a few more camera angles for the close-up debugging. This type of close-up shots, plus uh, the physically-based rendering of cycles, uh, plus a pretty high resolution will give a very good approximation. Time to render it out, it seems... not yet. First, let's do a couple of precautions. Select everything by pressing the A button, uh, then Space, search for Clear Restrict, and then select Clear Restrict View, and then press Space again, Clear Restrict, and select Clear All Restrict Render. But what does it mean? Let's switch uh, for the moment over to the outliner. If you accidentally turned off the render visibility or the viewport visibility, uh, these commands will bring it back. The other thing to take care of is the modifier settings. Uh, the render visibility and the viewport visibility of the modifiers, it must be consistent. Like, if the viewport visibility is set to on, the render visibility should be obviously set to on also. Chances are that in the viewport model looks awesome, but will explode during render. And that's pretty normal, because we have been working in the viewport. We haven't really checked how it looks on render. So I pressed F12 for render, 
And it takes quite a while because we have about 2 million vertices, 4 million triangles, and it takes about 2 gigabytes of video memory to render it out. On the other hand, the path tracing is pretty fast and the end result I think looks awesome. Ah, with the exception of this low poly tropical flower. I'm surprised that we see just one bug and not 25. And this bug looks very cool, I think. Some kind of a lovely low poly volcano eruption, sort of. Actually, the rest of the geometry looks great. Uh, the boolean shapes really stand out because of the contact shadows. And even though the image is a little bit grainy and this part could be problematic, I think, the overall look and feel and the details, I just love it. I want to fix this issue really quickly. Let's find the problematic object first. I think it's about some modifier. Uh, let's take a look. Is it array? Bevel? Yes, it's, uh, it's the bevel modifier that is flourishing. It should be disabled and now everything should be all right. At the same time, I want to see how the edge detection shader will look on this model. So I will plug it into the base color of the principal BSDF. F12 to render. This makeup really helps to accentuate and sharpen the geometry. I think sharpen is the right word here. Imagine sharpening a 2D image and seeing the details that previously wasn't there. I think adding the edge grime and dirt works in a very similar fashion. What we can do is render a bunch of images for comparison and then switch back and forth. Okay, I'm gonna turn off the edge detection for the time being. And now behold the camera cloud. Maybe it's an overkill, but I've added about 20 cameras to the scene. A bunch of telephoto cameras for the detail shots like this. Again, you can make the camera active by pressing Ctrl-0 on the numpad. I want to make sure that not only the overall mesh looks detailed, but also the focal points, like the sensors. I would describe it like this. There is a bunch of things to be taken into consideration. The first one is uh, simply how detailed the model is overall, especially considering the points of interest, like the sensors or the top battery and so on. Uh, the second thing is versatility. That's why we're checking the model from different angles using different focal lengths. The question is, uh, does it look consistently good from as many angles as possible? Or maybe it looks good only from one camera? If that's the case, and for example, the profile shot looks awful, it could be a reason to rework it a little bit. Fortunately for us, it seems that it looks really good. We are proud of you. Mm -hmm. Okay, now on a side note, I want to show you a script uh, that ID has written. Probably it falls outside the scope of this tutorial, but anyway, I'll show it to you. Basically, what this snippet of Python code does is that it takes all the cameras in this uh, Blender file and then it renders out all images from this array of cameras and adds PNG as the extension. Then it puts all the images near your Blend file. That's a cute little script that could save some time. Uh, you can download it from the resources pack, by the way. But it's not necessary for finishing the tutorial. You can just render everything manually. Okay, I'm gonna run the script. Then get myself a cup of coffee, because it will take uh, half an hour at best. When the rendering process is finished, I usually just dump everything into pure ref. What you can do next is examine all the images for geometry errors, check if everything seems to be alright, check the overall coherence of shapes and the distribution of details. Actually, that's an enormous pleasure to see this thing eventually rendered in cycles, because we have been working on it for so long. It was such a great ride, so worth it. I'm just staring at how it looks in cycles under the physically correct lighting conditions and my mind is blown. I believe that this approach that involves multiple camera angles and so on really helps to unpack the geometrical beauty of the hard surface assets like this. Of course, that's not the end point. We can use many different styles of rendering. We can take it, for example, to Unreal Engine. We can use Eevee. Alright guys, thanks for watching. In this tutorial we've taken a look at how to preview your 3D assets like a pro. Once again, this is a bonus tutorial from Hard Surface Modeling in Blender, our new video course, uh, which has already broken all records and uh, literally changed our lives. We don't know what to do with it yet, we are in the process of figuring it out. If you want to download the batch rendering script, check out the description of this video. Make sure to check out the Hard Surface Modeling video course if you haven't done it already. Massive appreciation for your support. That was Gleb Alexandrov for Creative shrimp.com, drink more coffee and we'll change the world of computer graphics.